This sermon is brought to you by Christ Church South Philadelphia, a church that is committed to living out the gospel in their neighborhood and from there impacting the world. For more information about our church or to support our mission, you can go to www.ChristChurchSouthPhilly.org. Um, this morning we're going to be studying 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 11. So you can go ahead and turn there in your Bible with me. And um, if, you don't, if you're here this morning and you don't have a Bible, you can just raise your hand. We actually have people who would love to get a Bible in your hands. We want everyone to be able to read this for themselves. The Word of God is such good news. We want you to see it for yourself and know that we're not making it up. So we're going to be in 1 Thessalonians 5.11. And here at Christ Church, typically what we do is we preach through a book of the Bible systematically. And so we just came out of a series in Jonah that we've been in the last four weeks. And in a couple of weeks, we're going to be starting a new series in the book of Jude. And that is a series that as pastors we've been praying about and are really excited about how God is going to meet our church as we study the book of Jude. But for the next two weeks, we're actually going to take a break in between those two books of the Bible. And we're going to study a couple of different passages that... Um, that really call us to how we're to act towards one another. These are passages that I think are really going to serve our church. And the reason for that is we as a church are centered on one thing, and one thing alone, and that is the gospel of Jesus Christ. But the beauty of the gospel is that while it is one timeless truth, it changes everything. And so for the next couple of weeks, we're going to look at how the gospel brings us into community with one another for specific purposes. And so today, I get the privilege of preaching on just one verse, one short verse. Um, And if you think that means this is going to be a short sermon, I apologize in advance. But I'm confident that as we study this one verse together, that, that even though we're just looking at one verse, we're going to see that God wants to do something very big and powerful in and through us in this verse. And so let's read together 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 11. Therefore, encourage one another and build one another up, just as you are doing. Since it's so short, let me just read that again. Therefore, encourage one another and build one another up, just as you are doing. May God bless the preaching and now the, re- the reading and the preaching of His Word. Um, I think at times um, we can encouragement is something that means a great deal to us, right? This is we all know that how great it feels to be encouraged. And so for me, there's a few instances that I can think of in my life where someone had a word of encouragement that was really powerful for me. And one of those instances was my senior year in high school. I had been on the varsity lacrosse team for three years and getting ready to go into my fourth year of varsity lacrosse. And for those of you who know me, you're probably thinking, wait a second, I thought you were homeschooled. How can homeschoolers play a sport? Well, we actually, I I grew up in Maryland, and in Maryland we actually had a homeschool Christian lacrosse team where we had kids from all over the state um, coming together. We would practice five days a week, and then you know we played games against private schools in Maryland, public schools in Maryland. We kind of traveled all over the state playing anyone who would take a chance at losing to a bunch of homeschoolers. Um, But but when we did that, going going back to my senior year of high school, it was around January, and I was getting prepared to play, and my head coach called me. And he called me and said, hey, Kale, we would love for you to be a captain on our lacrosse team. Now, I had been playing lacrosse since I was nine, but I was by no means one of the best players on the team. Now, I wasn't terrible. I had started the first three years on the team, but I, w- I was not someone who was leading the team in any kind of statistical category. Um, I, was, I played on defense, so I didn't really have statistics. I just kept other people from racking up goals to the best of my ability. But if, I if he would have asked me, hey, Caleb, who do you think should be a captain on the team? I wasn't someone that I would have picked. I wouldn't have said, hey, I, w- I want to be led by someone like me. And yet, I'll never forget that conversation with Coach Rocky. See, in asking me to be one of the captains, he didn't go on and on about how good I was or how the team really needed me because 
The truth was, both of us knew that wasn't the case. Like I said, I wasn't one of the best players on the team. No, but instead, what he said was, Caleb, the coaches and I want you to be a captain because of what kind of young man we think you are. You show up with a good attitude, you work hard, you're positive in your interactions with teammates, and from our perspective, you seem to love the Lord. And that's the kind of young man that we want to be a leader on this team. So are you interested? And like I said before, that conversation, I would have never thought of myself as a leader or a potential captain. That wasn't something that was like in my goals for senior year high school was to be a captain on the lacrosse team. But because of that conversation, he unlocked a desire in me to grow into the leader that they thought I could be. And I'm sure for each of us, we could all think of different times in different ways where we've had similar experiences, where someone's just said something really encouraging, impactful, that changed our perspective. And the reality is we live in a world where, crit- where critique and criticism are celebrated, but encouragement is not. And that happens not just in the world, but also in our own hearts. I think often our response to something ha- positive happening can be, yeah, but, right? I think of, you know, you think of a coworker being promoted, and our reaction is, yeah, but they've been sucking up to the boss. Of course, he's going to pick that guy, right? Or maybe even someone comes to the Lord, and our, our thoughts immediately are, yeah, but... Is it really genuine? Is it really going to last? Are they really going to change? I think of the revival or awakening or moving of God's Spirit that is happening right now at Ashbury College in Kentucky. And if you aren't aware, at Ashbury College in Kentucky, right now there's some kind of movement of God's Spirit happening there. College students are gathering every night in chapel. Um, Just that alone is a miracle, right? The idea that college students want to spend their evenings in chapel. But they're not just going to chapel, they're gathering to worship, to pray, and to confess sin. And not just general sins of what's happening in our society, but personal sins of how they've, God's brought conviction to their heart of how they fall short of God's glory. And as they're doing this, many more people are coming to faith in Jesus. And it seems that there really is a spirit a movement of God's Spirit happening in their midst. But even as news of this is happening, there are more than a few Christians who are extremely skeptical. And don't get me wrong, we are called to test all things. And there have been times in the past where people have called things revival that were not from God. Um, But I think here in this instance, there just seems to be an immediate knee-jerk reaction. We need to have a a response right away before, um, before we even really know the full extent of what God's doing or where it's going to go. I mean, and this obviously happens especially on social media platforms where we feel the need to have an opinion about something um, immediately. And so, so often, so many people are putting down things like what is happening in Ashbury before they've even had time to examine it. They say things like, yeah, But that college doesn't even have good theology. How could something happen like that there? Or it's probably just sensationalism. People are excited about an experience, and so lots of people are showing up to experience something. And from the research that I've done, and again, I'm no expert, but this doesn't seem to be the case in Ashbury. It doesn't seem to be the case that that's what's happening. And I think even even as we critique and are tempted to critique something like this, we're also the same people who are longing that God would bring revival to our communities. And so how sad is it that even as we pray that revival would come, that our temptation can be to doubt when it's actually happening? How easy it is for us to find reasons to be critical and discouraging. But here in our text this morning, in 1 Thessalonians 5.11, Paul's letter to this church in Thessalonica He's calling us to something much different than that. So here is our big idea this morning. People who have been saved by Jesus should encourage one another in Jesus. And we'll unpack this truth that those who have been saved by Jesus should encourage one another in Jesus in three points. First, 
we're going to see that encouragement is specific. Then we'll see that encouragement is significant. And lastly, we will look at encouragement is sought. So let's start with our first point this morning. Encouragement is specific. Here in our text this morning, we see that Paul begins with the word, therefore. See, Paul isn't just telling the Thessalonians to be encouraging because it's the nice thing to do. No, our encouragement is meant to be rooted in something. And so in saying, therefore, he is telling us that it is rooted in what he was just talking about. So if we look back at the previous two verses, we see where Christian encouragement should come from. He says in verse 9, For God has not destined us to wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us so that whether we are awake or asleep, we might live with him. Paul is making the point clear here. Encouragement isn't just saying positive things to one another. Rather, encouragement is rooted in remembering what Christ has done for us on the cross. And that just as as followers of Jesus, that our future is secure. See, as sinners, we are deserving of the wrath of God. And Jesus came and died the death that we deserve. So when we place our faith in Jesus, instead of being destined for God's wrath, we get to experience the salvation that comes through Jesus. And if you are here this morning and you've yet to place your faith in Christ, my prayer has been and is that today would be that day of salvation for you. You see, because of our sin, we are deserving of God's wrath. And maybe you're here this morning and you say, well, I'm not that bad. Well, er earlier in the Bible, in Romans 3.23, it says, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. See, it takes one slip up, just one selfish thought to fall short of God's glory. And if we're honest, even if we aren't that bad compared to some other people in society, we can all be honest and say that we've probably sinned a lot more than just once or twice. And God doesn't grade on a sliding scale. Any presence of sin in our lives is enough to condemn us. Psalm 14.3 says, There is none who does good. No, not even one. But the good news is that, Jesus, that God isn't just an angry judge. No, God the Father sent God the Son, Jesus, to live the perfect life that we can't live, to die the death that we deserve, to take on the sin for all of those who would believe in Him and place their faith in Him. Romans 5.8 says it this way, But God shows His love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And Jesus didn't just stay dead. But after dying on the cross, He rose victoriously from the grave, defeating sin and death for all of those who would place their faith in Him. And if you've yet to place your faith in Christ, I pray that you would do so. Romans 10.13 tells us that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Friend, may that be your experience this morning. And here in verse 11 of 1 Thessalonians 5, we see that Paul is showing us that as people who have been saved by Jesus, encouragement is not just man-centered flattery. No, encouragement is rooted in the hope we have in Christ. Now, there are many people in the world who are seemingly encouraging. People that when you spend time with them, even just for a few short moments, that you always walk away feeling much better about yourself. But that's not what Paul's at here. That's not what Paul's looking for. No, he wants something much deeper for the believers in Thessalonica. And by extension, he wants much, something much deeper and better for us here this morning. He doesn't want us to feel better about ourselves. 
That's not the solution. He wants us to stop looking at ourselves and to focus on what Christ has done. He is speaking of an encouragement that is deeper than what the world has to offer. Something deeper than just surface level observations in one another's lives. This encouragement he is speaking of serves our soul and reminds us of the hope we have in Christ. The Greek word that is translated encourage here means to exhort or admonish. So Paul isn't just calling us to simply affirm one another. Rather, something much deeper. He's calling for us as believers to remind one another who we are in Christ. To point out how we see God at work in one another. No matter the circumstances. Whether Good, bad, or ugly, no matter how our week has been, in Christ we have much to be encouraged about this morning. That our destiny is not to experience God's wrath, but instead to experience salvation through Jesus. And in Christ we are reminded that this world is not our home. We have a much better destination in mind than that which we are in right now. But as long as we are here, Christ is still at work in each of us. And to be honest, as I prepared this sermon this week, I was so aware that this isn't something that I'm good at. It's really easy for me to be critical and think about ways that other people need to grow or ways that I or others should do things differently. That that comes naturally to me. What doesn't come naturally to me is to, to be encouraging Sure, at times it can be easy for me to dish out good jobs or well done if someone does something, but not, not much deeper than that comes natural to me. But real, specific encouragement in Jesus, this is not something that I do well or naturally comes out of me. And so in preaching this sermon this morning, This is not the really encouraging guy getting up here this morning to tell you guys about how all of the tricks of the trade to be an encouraging person, and I'm here to give you advice about how you can be more like me. No, that is not what is happening here today. No, instead, I am bringing this message first and foremost because I need to hear it, and I need to apply it to my own life. But even in this weakness, this verse reminds me and all of us, that God is at work. And just as he promises at the end of 1 Thessalonians 5, in verse 24, he says, He who calls you is faithful. He will surely do it. Friends, our hope is not in our own strength to be good encouragers. But our hope is in the fact that God is at work. And he is going to cause us to continue to grow. Paul then continues here in verse 11 and says, not just to encourage one another, but also to build one another up. Now, encouraging one another and building one another up are similar ideas. And so the question can be, well, is Paul just reiterating the same point over and over again to kind of emphasize that we need to encourage one another. But I don't think that's what he's doing. See, the Greek word for build up means to promote growth in Christian wisdom, affection, grace, virtue, holiness, and blessedness. And the term build up is also a construction term. It literally means what it says. You're to build or create something. And so here, Paul is telling us that even as we encourage one another, that we are also to continue to build up Christian growth in one another. He's saying that our words towards one another should be in such a way that when we walk away from our conversations with one another, that we are in awe of what Christ is doing in and through each other's lives. And that through interacting with one another, that we would be resolved to continue to grow in godliness. Encouragement is meant to be specific about the work of God in one another's lives. 
not just kind flattery, but encouragement that is saturated in Christ's work in our lives. Friends, don't we need this? Don't we long for a community of people who stir our affections for Jesus? Who, when we walk away from having been with them, that we just are in awe of how good God is and what God is doing. Think of the significance that is found in such encouragement. Which leads us to our second point. Encouragement is significant. Even as we have been talking about encouragement and how it needs to be specific, I think at times we can act like encouragement is kind of beneath us. At least I know I, know I can. That, yeah, encouragement obviously is nice. It's always good when someone encourages you, but reality is I don't really need it. Um, it's something that, that is great to have, but I'll, I'll be okay without it. But here, Paul's making it clear that we actually do need encouragement. Saying that we can get through this life without the encouragement of others is just silly bravado. We even see this in Paul's life. Think about it for a minute. Here's Paul, the Apostle Paul. No one in the New Testament planted more churches than Paul. If anyone was above needing encouragement, it would be him. You would think that he would function with just a humble confidence of the fact that he was above needing encouragement. But here in 1 Thessalonians, we see that that isn't the case. Now, we're just studying one verse in 1 Thessalonians this morning, but earlier in the chapter, we see that Paul's in deep need of encouragement. If you rewind with me for a second back to Acts 17, it tells us about how this church got started. Paul had visited the city of Thessalonica, and he had planted a church there. But in Acts 17, we see that he then had to leave quickly and abruptly. There was a disturbance that rose up in the town, and then it basically came down to, we're going to shut down this church unless you get that guy Paul out of town. And so they actually paid him off. They paid off the officials in the city of Thessalonica so that Paul could leave and they could continue to function. So Paul had to leave quickly and abruptly even after only being there for a short time. And so as a result, when he's writing this letter to the church in Thessalonica, this first Thessalonians, when he's writing this, he's worried about the state of their church. His attitude wasn't one of, well, I planted the church. Yeah, I had to leave quickly, but I'm I'm pretty good church planner. They'll be fine. No, that wasn't his attitude at all. In chapter 3, verse 5, he says this. He says, for this reason, When I could bear it no longer, I sent to learn about your faith. For fear that somehow the tempter had tempted you and our labor would be in vain. Here we see Paul, the great Apostle Paul, wrestling with fear. And in light of the fear that he's experiencing, he was in need of encouragement. And he receives the encouragement that he was in need of when he gets the report of how their church was doing. He finds that despite the circumstances that had caused him to leave quickly, that God had continued to be at work in this church in Thessalonica. Verses 6 and 7 of chapter 3 say, But now that Timothy has come to us from you and has brought us the good news of your faith and love and reported that you always remember us kindly and long to see us as we long to see you, For this reason, brothers and sisters, in all our distress and affliction, we have been comforted about you through your faith. What encouragement this must have been to Paul. Despite his worst fears that their time planning this church was in vain, the church was actually thriving. And not only were they thriving, but they were still remembering and praying for Paul. They were still longing to see Paul again. His work hadn't been forgotten. No, his work had been multiplied. And if the great Apostle Paul was in need of such encouragement, surely we are in need of it as well. And I think if we're honest, we probably don't really need to be 
convinced that we need encouragement. Just like Paul, we can often find ourselves in fearful situations. This life is full of trials, disappointments, and difficulty. There are many reasons that we need encouragement this morning. For one, much like Paul did, we can often feel like our efforts are in vain. Maybe you've been sharing the gospel with a friend or a loved one or a neighbor, and yet despite all of your efforts, they still have little to no interest in the Lord. In these circumstances, I think it's easy for us to feel like, is it even worth it? Should I even continue? Clearly this isn't working. They're not receiving. Should I just stop? Or maybe you've been consistently working hard at your job, yet you haven't received the promotion that you've been hoping for and feel that you are deserving of. Or maybe you're here this morning and you would love to have a job where you could be stressed out about. But instead, you've, despite all of your efforts, you still haven't found the job that you are looking for, that good paying job that um, will be able to provide for your needs. Or maybe you come here this morning as a weary parent, faithfully seeking to disciple your kids, yet coming to church this morning acutely aware of the fact that just getting your kids dressed and out the door on time is a huge win for you. Not to mention actually taking time to intentionally point them to Jesus and disciple them. If you're anything like me, you have lots of reasons to be discouraged. Yes, we have Jesus. And that means the world. And it carries us through day by day. But friends, if you're anything like me, there are days where it feels like that's all you have. But friends, here in this morning, in this text, God is reminding us that in drawing us to himself, he has also brought us into a community with one another so that we can give and receive much needed encouragement. Just last week, we finished a series on Jonah. It was a great series. It was super helpful. Um, but in light of how that book ended, the coldness and, and really with the picture of the coldness of Jonah's heart, one of the things that hit me afterwards just thinking about that um, and even as you know, reflecting on this passage here in 1 Thessalonians is, man, Jonah really could have used a couple good godly friends to give him counsel. Now, that, that wasn't the point of the story of Jonah. Um, so I'm not rewriting what Jonah's about. But just in light of this passage here, Jonah could have used someone who would have been there to encourage him in the ways of the Lord, to have a brother or sister who would point him back to the Lord, how the Lord had been faithful in his life, how it was good for the Lord to show mercy and kindness on the people of Nineveh. He needed someone to build him up, to remind him, to continue to press into the Lord, to continue to grow in godliness. And so one of the things I think we can really take away from that is just how dangerous it can be for us to be isolated. And I think you know, after COVID, we're all very aware of that, right? None of us ever want to go back to the isolation that was 2020. And so I think even as we think about how at times it can be beneficial to take time away and to isolate ourselves, to spend time with the Lord, that even in those times where it's good to just be alone and to be studying with the Lord and praying with the Lord, even in those times, the goal of that is not isolation. The goal of that is to be refreshed in the Lord and to then be fueled to go back into the community where we live, to be encouraged and to encourage it is a dangerous place for us to be stuck in our own thoughts, in our own head, without godly people around us to encourage us and challenge us. And we see this. This isn't just an idea. We see this in Scripture. We see how in the New Testament, the Christian community was essential. There were no Christians in the New Testament who, didn't also, who weren't also a part of Christian community. Jesus himself spent almost every waking hour with 12 of his closest friends. 
Even when Jesus then tells His disciples to be sent out to go and do the ministry, in Mark 6-7, it says, He called the twelve and began to send them out. Two by two. He sent them out in pairs. And then, after Jesus ascended and the early church is established, we see that, again, people were sent out, not alone, but in pairs. Now, if they were trying to reach the most amount of people possible, if they were trying to set up a way to, how can we get Christianity to exponentially grow in the next 10 years, you would think it would make sense to take each of their most gifted individuals in their most gifted individuals and send them their separate ways. We can conquer the most ground that way. We'll be able to explode. But that's not what they did. See, they sent Paul and Barnabas together. They didn't send them separately. And I think that they understood that sending people out individually would not produce longevity. They weren't just looking to get a big number of souls converted. They were looking to establish churches that would last. And Barnabas' name here actually means the son of encouragement. And early in Paul's ministry, as he's looking to go out, it was Barnabas that he chose to go with him. You see, Paul understood that we are created with a need for a community of encouragement. This is also one of the reasons that they planted churches. They didn't just focus on individual conversions, but they created communities of people together. That the gospel didn't just bring people to God, but it brought people together with one another as well. And this life can be so hard. But I don't have to tell you that. As I said before, I'm sure there are all kinds of significant situations, even now, in your lives, where you are aware of the desperate need we are, that we have to be surrounded by a people who will encourage us and continue to point us to the fact that we have a hope in Jesus. Which brings us to our last point. Encouragement is specific. Encouragement is significant. And lastly, encouragement is sought. Now I understand when I say encouragement is sought, that's kind of a weird phrase. But the reality is I had two S's for the first two points and Salt was the best S word that I could come up with that was appropriate to share. So I went with this. So thank you for giving me um, the opportunity to to do this. Thanks for bearing with using the word salt. Um, I gave it the good old college try. So um, I was homeschooled. This is is the best you get. Um, But when I say that encouragement is salt, what I really mean is that we are called in this passage to seek to be intentional with our encouragement. So let's spend a few minutes here as we close focusing on how we can intentionally seek to encourage one another. I think if any of you are are similar to me, being someone who is encouraging isn't something that comes naturally and just flows out of us without intentionality. This is why we have to seek to be encouraging. It can be somewhat easy to say thank you or tell someone good job But as we already saw, what Paul is talking about here is something so much deeper than that. And our task to encourage one another by pointing out how we see God at work, that is our task. Our task is to point people to how God is at work in their lives and to encourage them to continue to foster their relationship with the Lord. To to point people to how God is using them to encourage you in your faith or to challenge one another to look to Jesus and what he has done for us. Now, to do this, it assumes that we know others and are known by others. And so the first step to prioritizing building relations is to prioritize building relationships here at our local church. One of the reasons that we say at the end of each service to find someone whose name you don't know and introduce yourself is because we want to be a church that actually knows one another. Not just each other's names, but to be people who are fostering and developing real, lasting relationships with one another. And so the question this morning that I think that that we should be asking is, are there people here who know how you're doing? Like, really know how you're doing. 
And on the flip side, are there people here who you know how they're doing? This is what God's calling us to, is, is to be people who can answer those questions. And again, I say this not from a position of strength, because this isn't, this isn't my wheelhouse by any stretch. Some people are an open book. After being in conversation with them for five minutes, they're ready to share with you all of the ways that God's working in their life and how they need to grow. If that's you, you are a blessing. Thank you. We need more people like that. But that is not me. I'm very aware that I can be a tough nut to crack, that I can be someone who really has to be drawn out about how am I really doing? How is such and such really impacting me? But I'm so grateful that even though that's not my strength, and even though I can be a hard person to pursue, that there are people here, that some of you who do that regularly, who pursue me and say, how are you really doing? And who allow me to ask that question back to them and to minister to one another. And if you're here this morning and you don't really know anyone here, maybe this is even your first time here, Again, we're so glad that you're here. Or maybe you've been here for a while, but you haven't felt like you've gotten connected. I would encourage you. I would strongly encourage you. One of the ways to do that is to get connected to a community group or a men's Bible study or women's Bible study. These are places where we can really begin to know one another and be known by one another. And so stop by the info table on your way out. They would be happy to give you resources to how you can get more connected to a community group. Or even better than that, before heading out to the info table, stop someone on your way out and just introduce yourself and ask them how they're connected to Christ Church and what that looks like and if you could join them the next time they have a community group. God is calling us to be in community with one one another, to be a community who encourages one another. And when I first came to Christ Church, the idea of being in a community group was kind of foreign to me. Um, I'd grown up in the church, but... um, Small group, I'd been in youth group and that kind of thing, but small groups wasn't something I had personally, or community groups, sorry, it's going to take a while. Community groups weren't something that I naturally had been a part of before being at Christ Church. And so when I first joined this church, um, I was in a community group here in South Philly, um, and Jesse and I were dating at the time. She was living in Maryland, I was here in Philly, and each week we had community group. There's a guy, Jim Beatty, who no longer is a member here. He's since moved out of town. But each week at community group, whether Jesse was there or not, she would probably come maybe 50% of the time from Maryland just to come to community group to get to know the community people that I was involved with. But each week, he would stop me and say, Caleb, have you proposed yet? And we didn't, we didn't date for that long of a time. It was only like 10 months. But even like after a month after dating, Jim had met Jesse, and he was convinced that she was way out of my league. And so he started just... Every time he saw me, Caleb, have you proposed to Jesse yet? And every time that I said no, he would look at me and he would say, you're an idiot. And if you know Jim, that was one of his gifts of encouragement was just tell it how it is. And so he would look at me and say, you're an idiot. You realize she's in Maryland all week and there's probably some guy there who's way better than you are who's currently wooing her away from you. And so he would say, you better hurry up before she comes to her senses. And praise God, she's yet to come to her senses. Um, But I'm I'm so grateful for people like Jim, who encouraged me in that aspect, but he also encouraged me in Jesus. He encouraged me to look to Jesus as my hope. When hard times were happening, Jim would be happy to tell it like it is, but always point me back to Jesus. And I'm, I'm grateful for people like that. And so being a part of a community group in those early years of being at Christ Church changed my life. I Again, it's something that was kind of foreign to me. I'm like, what are we doing here? But God used it in a profound way to help me to be a person who was known and who could know others. And that's, that's what, as community groups, that's what we're, di- we're seeking to do is to be a group of people who are known and who know one another and who seek to grow together to love Christ more. And so if you're here and you haven't joined a community group, that's my shameless plug for, for doing so. And if you are here and you have joined a community group and you're a part of that, praise God. But I would just continue. I would, um, I would just encourage you to continue to do so. Continue to be a part of that. Be all in in your community group. Be willing to be someone who shares about what's really going on in your life. How, you, how God's really met you this week and encouraged you or how you're feeling discouraged and you just need prayer. To, to be in that community group and to be a part of it and to be all in 
and to experience the mercy and grace of God through the ministry of his people. I think another way that we can seek to be a people of encouragement is we need to be intentional. And what I mean by being intentional is that when you see God at work in others, or when you see how God's at work in others and that encourages you, to intentionally share that with that person. As we've already said, we are all in need of encouragement. And we can often downplay how impactful a small word of encouragement is, how, how impactful a small word of encouragement in Christ can be. But you see, when, when you see God at work in someone else's life, that might be exactly what God is going to use to minister to their heart. And God didn't show you how he's at work in their life for you to keep it to yourself. No, he wants us to share it with others. And I doubt that anyone's ever received a word of encouragement and their response was, why are you, why are you sharing this with me? That's, that's not helpful, right? That's, that's not a response when we're encouraged. So even if it's something small, you think this, this doesn't need to be shared. Share it. You never know how God's going to use that to encourage someone else and how God's going to use that to minister to them. So let's intentionally share encouragement with one another. And I think one of the ways that we can do this is by just stopping, pausing, putting down our phone, turning off the TV, and just writing a short note of how we've seen God at work in someone's life. Whether it's a handwritten note, trust me, you don't want one of those from me, um, or a text or an email, write it out and then share it with that person. I heard one pastor say one time that he made it a practice to write out at least one note of encouragement every single day. Because there wasn't a day that went by where we aren't impacted by how God's at work in others. So may we be a people who take time to just intentionally pause and stop and encourage one another. And so I ask us, if you're here and you're married, how aware is your spouse of how you are encouraged by them? And before you say, well, you don't know my spouse, you're right, I might not. But I know me and how awful I can be. And yet, Jesse finds ways to encourage me. And so if she can find something in me that's worth commending, I'm sure you also can do the same. And it might take some intentionality to look for that. But may we be people who seek to encourage one another in our marriages. Parents, do your kids know how encouraged you are by them? If you're here this morning, you're single. Do your close friends, do your family members, do your coworkers, do those, do those close to you know how you are encouraged by them? I would exhort all of us, encourage all of us, to take time this week to just remind a couple people of how we've seen God at work in their life and how that has blessed us, how God's used that to encourage us to look to Jesus. May we be a church who are a people who intentionally seek to encourage one another and build one another up in Christ Jesus. In closing, Paul ends this verse by saying, just as you are doing. Just as you are doing. See, throughout this letter, Paul had challenged the church in Thessalonica to do things that they'd already been doing, but not to be satisfied with their progress, to continue doing it in even deeper ways. In in chapter 4, verse 1, he says, Finally then, brothers, we ask and urge you in the Lord Jesus that as you receive from us how you ought to walk and to please God, just as you are doing, that you do so more and more. Again, in chapter 4, verse 9 and 10, he says, Now concerning brotherly love, you yourselves have been taught by God to love one another. For that indeed is what you are doing. But we urge you, brothers, to do this more and more. Christ Church, our charge is the same. As a church, we do a pretty good job of encouraging one another. I am encouraged by how we encourage one another. But I, and I can think of so many ways that many of you have said things that God has used to just encourage and stir my affections for him. But just like the Thessalonians, we cannot sit back and be satisfied with our progress. No, we must continue to grow and strive to be a people 
who encourage one another and build one another up more and more. There is often so much to be discouraged about in this life. But may we be a people who never lose sight of the salvation that has been obtained for us in Christ Jesus. And may we never stop encouraging one another in the hope we have in Jesus. Because people who have been saved by Jesus should encourage one another in Jesus. Oh church, may we leave today compelled to encourage one another in the ways we see Christ at work in our lives, just as you are doing. Let's pray.